now uh, I would like to turn to our next speaker, uh, Mariko Peters, who is the Senior Peace and Conflict Advisor in the Conflict Prevention and Mediation Support Division at the European External Action Service. Uh, so uh, Mariko, over to you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction and thanks very much uh, to the organizers of this Polonia Peace Building Forum uh, for inviting me. And also, I'd like to compliment you for um, how you've um, um, sequenced all the speakers, because um, what I will now share is the perspective of a civil servant working in a governmental, um, international governmental institution, the European Union. And I think um, um, what the previous speakers have already shared will allow me to nicely build on it and um, um, share with you how we're trying to turn um, all their insights into practice. So the question that was put to me was this, how does the EU work on peace building and climate change? And um, I love that question, why? Because 15 years ago, when I was a defense spokesperson for the Dutch Green Party, we would still be laughed at as exaggerating tree huggers when suggesting that there was perhaps a link between climate and conflict. But now one of the biggest bureaucracies in Europe is embracing such a challenge with support from 27 countries and member states. So my contribution for today can therefore actually be quite simple. Four observations. One, we spent a long time translating climate warnings into awareness that this climate change affects the security landscape. And that has rendered us with a series of high level political declarations, which in turn has given us institutional practitioners political green light to go ahead. Number two, we are only now starting to operationalize it into action. Three, to do that, we're upgrading existing tools for crisis response and peace building with a climate version, green sauce. And four, that practice presents us with a few pertinent lessons and challenges and opportunities already. Let me illustrate these four points with some examples. On the political green light. So I, as I said, it took about 30 years since the intergovernmental pedal of climate change started presenting the world with the warnings of the effects of climate change and the need to do something about it. It took another 20 years for that insight to trickle into the security domain, Oliver talked about it, when the military started to speak in 2008 about climate change as a security concern. Since then, the narrative has settled in. Climate change is a threat multiplier. Climate change, an existential threat. Ample scientific evidence has in the meantime been collected that demonstrate the point. We have water conflicts, pastoralist farmer conflicts, natural resource conflicts, climate refugees, you know the reports. Of late, you've seen a flurry of council conclusions that reflect this. We have uh, European conclusions of climate and defense, climate and diplomacy, climate energy and diplomacy. And these declarations have paved the way for big policymaking. Plans like the EU Green Deal of the current commission to cut gas emissions, to help slow down climate change, with reduction, transition, adaptation, mitigation. We have adopted the new EU biodiversity strategy that will enable the EU to commit um, to restoring and protecting all world's ecosystems at the upcoming biodiversity conference 2021. We have the EU forest strategy on which consultations by the way are ongoing right now online. We have since last year, a climate and defense roadmap that aims to reduce the ecological footprint of military because armies are the largest national single emitters. And lastly, to zoom in specifically now also on climate peace building, we have the new EU mediation guidelines that take climate awareness as a guiding principle for EU mediation support. So how are we operationalizing all these plans? Because that's all they are, plans. Well, if you think that 30 years was a long time for climate change awareness to land in security and peacemaking policies, think about how long the operationalization might take. To operationalize new climate security awareness into action will require an entirely different way of working. Instead of police reformers, we perhaps need to send hydrologists to conflicts. Instead of human rights trainings, we might need to instruct our diplomats and peacemakers on climate feedback loops and statistics. 
our security policy development specialists need to learn how to collaborate with environmentalists. Wait, my battery is almost finished. Um, and that requires no less than institutional reform. Institutional reform is a tough thing to do. Before joining the EAS, I was briefly with the World Bank, and there the data crunchers have calculated that on averages, on average, in good situations, it takes about 40, 40 years to do effective institutional reform. So the challenges are immense. If you're serious about addressing climate-related conflict, we need to be both realistic and find the acceleration button. What have we been doing so far? Well, at least there is a huge opportunity for coming into action. Within the EU, actually, there's never been more momentum. We are rolling out, as we speak, the biggest development cooperation budget in history for the coming seven years, roughly 90 billion euros. As we speak, the delegations in countries around the world are drafting programming plans for how to spend the money. And 30% of that budget, 24 billion euros, is earmarked for climate adaptation and mitigation, of which more than half will land in conflict-affected states who are the most impacted by climate change. And we are now busy conducting conflict analysis in all these countries to inform the programming, the program design, and are starting to factor in climate data and implications in these analysis. That should enable us to design more climate sensitive conflict responses. We're also increasingly using climate and environment indicators in our early warning systems. Until two years ago, Unlike EGAT, who's been in the middle of climate change already for uh, ever since it existed. But it, uh, with us, uh, since two years, no, two years ago, climate was not even part of our early warning system. Now we have a handful of climate indicators and we're looking into integrating more. So please come back in three years time when we'll do our midterm review of all these plans and check how we've managed to take this matter into action. Some lessons, challenges. What does this practice teach us? Some early lessons are these. We need to break down the silos. It seems so easy to say it is so difficult to do. There is a massive gap between the climate, environment, development, security and peace experts. Each, to take the EU as an example, each have their own commissariats, divisions, procedures, motives, triggers, knowledge. How do you get across? That requires people management, education, trust building, investing immense amounts of energy in coordination, new collaboration arrangements, knowledge sharing across disciplines. Teleworking helps. We sat in different buildings and countries. Now we connect through the screen as we do today. Second, we need to learn how to combine and use the relevant data and processes. Climate work, as has been said by my previous speakers, is very much science driven, and peace building is very much about process facilitation. So climate people need to translate their data into user-friendly bits and learn about peacemaking processes. Peacemakers need to learn how to access climate data and get these to the right negotiation tables. The high level international scenes, the communities in the field where the climate change already is manifesting itself in conflict landscapes. And civil society and think tanks like yourselves are often paving the way here. You need to continue to bombard us with reports and field stories of how you're already experimenting with this. Two more challenges, if I may. How can we better turn resource conflicts into opportunities for peace? A recent example that I know of comes from Darfur, an EU funded project, but in a pilot fashion. There were many infrequent water conflicts and through a combination of infrastructure support, soft skills training, data sharing, the setup of conflict resolution and water management platforms, those conflicts reduced by two thirds, according to an evaluation. We have the means, now we need to upscale and support much more of this. And as a last challenge, I'd like to share, we need to broaden the narrative, accept and navigate complexities and interconnectedness, live up to those challenges with a communal perspective. We have to do it together. Because it's not only about security threats and multipliers. It's not only about carbon, temperature, water. It's about ecosystems, biodiversity, oil, minerals, metals, land, water, human action, 
gender governance, energy transition, technology, climate, feedback loops, geopolitics. It's not about nice linear causalities between a drought and a war, but about existing vulnerabilities, changing livelihoods, like Farah from Cipri has explained, changing migration patterns, changing armed group tactics, aggravating elite behavior. It's both hyperlocal, regional, transboundary, and global all at once. The policymakers, programmers, and the electorate have this in common. They generally don't like such complexity. They prefer simplicity, linearity, short-term results. To overcome these tendencies, we need accountability and awareness raising. This I'm saying on purpose to this audience today, because I think that that is your role, to hold the institutions accountable, check against oversimplifications, check on promises in the healthy checks and balances, and to feed the public debate with why a complex system response is necessary to live up to complex security challenges. Because whatever it is that we're already doing with all the good intentions, it has to be more. Thank you.